When I first began to think and pray about what I should preach on at these monthly together services, I felt very strongly that the Lord was saying to preach about the subject of unity. It seems to me that it is an important subject for us to be looking at for a number of reasons. Let me give you three reasons, and this is the bit that some of you have heard before. Ever since we started our three 1030 congregations in 2021, we've been aware of the question, how does three congregations of one church actually work? And given that we sense that for most people, the congregation that they belong to is where they get their main sense of belonging, how do we express our unity as one church when our sense of belonging is largely in the three congregations? What does unity look like for us all together in that setting? And so it's an issue that we've been aware of for some time. And I don't think it's a problem. It's just a fact of life. We have to work out how does three congregations of one church actually work? And what does unity look like when each congregation has a slightly different look and feel and maybe does things in a slightly different way? And then a second reason why I think it's an important subject for us to be looking at at the moment is, as I trust you know, we're currently engaged in conversations within Warfield Church on issues of human sexuality under the title of Living in Love and Faith. We've already had two sessions, one with Bishop Olivia, uh, one with Jody Stoll, and this evening we'll be having the third session uh, with Sean Doherty. We'll give you the full details about that later in the notices. Uh, and then we've put an extra session in. You should have had an email about that because became aware that as well as listening to speakers and asking questions, it would be helpful maybe for people to be given an opportunity to share their own thoughts and their own feelings on the subject. So we've added a, a fourth session in without a speaker where the speakers will be you given the opportunity to speak. And we're aware that there is a great range of beliefs and views on these issues. And so we're asking the question, what does unity look like for people who hold views which appear to be irreconcilable? If you've been following uh, what's been happening in General Synod, uh, some of us do it for fun, uh, others perhaps don't quite regard it as as much fun, um, you'll know that that's again recently been an issue that has been discussed and, and it's almost as if at the moment a pause button has been pressed. Things will continue, but there's that sense of realizing we are not going to agree on this subject. So how do we handle that? And the issue that the national church is facing is exactly the same issue that we as a local church have to face, which is how do we continue to express unity when we fundamentally disagree on something that some people regard as very important. For others, it's not an important issue, but for those for whom it is an important issue, it's a very important issue. And so how do we continue to express unity when we fundamentally disagree about something? It's a real question that we're grappling with. And then, of course, Whilst we're speaking openly and frankly, we are aware of a new worshipping community in our locality meeting just probably a few hundred yards away from us even now uh, that David Ritchie and others have started uh, in this locality. And people who used to be part of Warfield Church have chosen to align themselves with that new community. And so there are some very practical questions that we have to ask about what does unity look like? What might we be able to do together? When might that be possible? If we want to, would they want to? You know, there are all kinds of questions that we have to grapple with where people whom we know and love and honor and respect have made the decision to start something new and different that is outside of the Church of England. What does unity look like? 
And so, for those three reasons, and probably others as well, I thought this was very important that we look at this subject of unity in this context. And then I had a conversation with Vicky, and she spoke about the fact that here at Warfield Church East, they were wanting to look at the subject of community as part of a series. And so we agreed to combine our thinking into a joint series on the subject of unity and community. The plan being that today at this Together service, I would begin looking at the theme of unity. And then on the Sundays following, when I visit the different congregations, I'd continue looking at that same subject. And we'll probably keep that theme going right through to the summer. And then on the alternate weeks when I'm not there, congregational preachers will think and preach about the subject of community. And so we'll put together unity and community. And then, of course, spotted the fundamental flaw in that plan, which was that there were two Sundays that I was visiting congregations before today and what we were going to do with those. And so at the West and the East, I did Unity, the prequel, where we talked a little bit about it, um, but didn't get into the meat of the subject. Andy Green was kind enough to post a link to that sermon in the Warfield Church North Facebook group. So it may be that some of you from the North have actually taken the opportunity to listen to that as well. And in the prequel, what we looked at were all the things that the New Testament tells us that we have in common. Things that are introduced in the scriptures by the phrase, there is one. And uh, I found 21, and the 21 that are on my list are those 21 that are up there. First four, very much about God the Father, then a cluster that are all about Jesus, then a reference to the Holy Spirit, there's one spirit, and then some things about us, that we share a common humanity, that in Christ we share a new humanity, that we're one body, one flock, and as one body, one flock, we have one hope, one faith, one baptism. There was one sacrifice for sin, and when we break bread together, we share in one loaf, as we did today. And brothers and sisters, these are the things that the Bible tells us we all have in common, and therefore these are the things that are the basis of our unity. If you look at that list, then you may spot that it looks a little bit like one of the creeds of the church. As you know, there are three major creeds in the Christian church. You do know that, don't you? They are the Nicene, the Apostles, and then the third one always catches people out, but people from the West should know because I've preached on and referred to it recently, recently as in the past year the Athanasian Creed, but that's, that's a long, complicated one. It's mainly the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed that are commonly used. But there's one difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed that I find quite interesting. If I put up the opening words of both creeds, can you spot the difference? In the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What's the fundamental difference between those two opening statements? That's right. The Apostles' Creed says, I, but the Nicene Creed says, we believe. And I think there's something very important about that that the Nicene Creed is intended to be read together with other believers. It's intended to be something that we say together. And in a moment, I'm going to invite us to do that, to say it together. And I'm going to make a request. And the request is this, that in the coming weeks and months, in all three of our 1030 congregations, that we make a point from time to time of saying the Nicene Creed together. We already do it every Sunday at the 8.30 communion, so those of you who normally turn up at 8.30 in St. Andrews, you're ahead of the game already. We do this every Sunday at the 8.30 service. And in most Anglican churches, it would be said every Sunday in every communion service. If we were a typical Anglican church, we would already have said it in the service by now. 
And the creeds, of course, are designed to remind us of the fundamentals of our faith. And there's something that is important for us about saying the creed. It's, it's a reminder, these are the things that I believe. It, it's, it's a good thing to be reminded. Uh, to me, it's a little bit like this. I remember once going to Ikea. I tried to avoid doing that. Anna and I have our greatest arguments in Ikea. Um, we won't go there to draw a veil over that. But as I was leaving Ikea on one occasion, I saw a sign that said something like this. Please keep the tools that we give you to assemble your furniture and use them from time to time to tighten the fixings. What a helpful piece of advice. What we've sold you is likely to get a bit rickety, so tighten it up from time to time. And maybe our faith is a bit like that, isn't it? Our faith occasionally gets a little bit rickety, a little bit shaky. And so we need something to help us tighten the fixings again, to remind us. These are the things that we believe in. And when we say the creed, it's a little bit like taking that tool that you were given at Ikea and using it just to tighten the fixings again and say, no, this is what I believe. These are the things that are important to me. But I also believe that it's more than that. It's when we say the creed together, especially if we're using the Nicene Creed and we say, we believe it's a way in which we publicly say to one another, these are the things that unite us. We believe this. It's not just that I believe it, but we believe this. And however differently we may do things in our three congregations, we believe this. Whatever issues we may disagree about, we believe this. Whichever group or community of faith someone may choose to worship with, these are the things that unite us. So I'm going to invite you now to stand and to say together the Nicene Creed. I won't put the words up because you all know it, don't you? Okay, I will put the words up, just joking. Can I encourage you to say it joyfully, confidently, dare I even say loudly? to declare the things that unite us. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Do please be seated. Well, all of that was summary and introduction. We haven't even got to today's Bible passages and theme, because today I want us to ask and hopefully answer just one question, and it's this. Why does unity matter? I think it's a reasonable question to ask. If I say, as I did, that unity is the theme that I'm planning to preach on uh, at the Together Services right up to the summer, then you would be justified in asking, why does it matter? And my answer to that question is actually a very simple one. I believe that unity matters 
because unity matters to Jesus. And how do we know that unity matters to Jesus? Well, let's have the first of our Bible readings as we start to answer that question. This is John chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. If we'd read the whole of John chapter 10, uh, we would see that Jesus in this chapter is talking to the Pharisees. And at times, Jesus has some very strong words to say to the Pharisees. If you want to read some of them, then I suggest you look at Matthew chapter 23 from verse 13 onwards, and you will see there that Jesus refers to the Pharisees as hypocrites, blind guides, blind fools, whitewashed tombs, snakes, and a brood of vipers. If only Dale Carnegie had lived before Jesus so that Jesus could have read how to win friends and influence people, so, so what was it that Jesus, so why was it that Jesus so harsh in his statements to the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees started out well. They knew that God had chosen Israel to be his people. And they knew that God wanted his people to live holy lives. And so they did all that they could to separate themselves from anything that might hinder them from being holy. The very name Pharisee probably comes from a Hebrew or Aramaic word, parush, which means to separate. They were the separated ones. And they were especially keen to separate themselves from Gentiles, from non-Jewish people. Because if they mixed with Gentiles, if they mixed with non-Jewish people, then they would become unholy. And then Jesus comes, and here in this passage, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And then in a very subtle way, he is saying to them, and not all of my sheep are going to be Jewish sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. In other words, he was letting them know what Jesus came to do wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the Jews and the Gentiles. And so he says, there will be one flock and one shepherd. And as we read the history of the first church in the book of Acts, and as we see it also reflected in the letters in the New Testament, we see that there were big discussions about should Gentiles be allowed to be part of the church? And if they are allowed to be part of the church, on what terms should they be allowed to be part of the church? Because they're different from us. They're Gentiles and we're Jews. Should they be allowed in at all? And if so, on what terms should they be allowed in? And the risk was that they could so easily have ended up being a Jewish church and a Gentile church. And Jesus, foreseeing that that was a possibility here, makes it very clear one flock, one shepherd. Not a Jewish church and a Gentile church, but one church in which there is neither Jew nor Greek, Jew or Gentile. 
And John, who wrote this gospel, clearly understood this because in the next chapter, in John chapter 11, he records how Caiaphas, the high priest, speaks about Jesus dying. And John actually gives us an editorial note and he says, Caiaphas didn't say this on his own, but as high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. Unity matters because unity matters to Jesus. Jesus did not want a church that was fragmented into Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. He wanted one church with one shepherd. He spoke about it. He taught about it. He taught that the things that previously had been the basis of division and separation would be done away with. No separation between Jew and Gentile, one flock, one shepherd. And Jesus not only taught about it, perhaps more importantly, we know that Jesus prayed for it. So we're going to have our second Bible reading now, and Will, I believe you're going to come and read that one for us. Thank you. After Jesus had said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they obeyed your word. I will remain in the world no longer, but you are still in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we, as, as we are one. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. John chapter 17, we have this insight into the prayer life of Jesus and particularly this prayer that is prayed as Jesus is approaching the cross. Many people have commented that when you read John chapter 17, it is as if we are standing on holy ground as we are hearing the words that Jesus prays just before he goes to the cross. It's an amazing chapter full of truth, well worth taking time to meditate on. And in it, Jesus, first of all, he prays for his disciples, for those who have followed him during his earthly ministry. He's aware that he is about to return to heaven, but they are going to stay on earth. And so his prayer for them is that they may be one as we are one. And then he prays not just for them, not just for the disciples who had followed him whilst he was here on earth, but he prays for all those who would come to believe in him through their message. And that has to mean those in every generation Every generation since then, those who've come to believe in him, right down to us today in 2024. In John chapter 17, as Jesus prepares to go to the cross, he prayed for us. Let's take that in. He was praying for us. 
all those who would believe in him through the message that would be passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation until one day someone came to a far-flung corner of the world called Warfield and preached about Jesus here. And a church was planted here and he was praying for us. And his prayer is the same that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And then he adds another phrase, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And that phrase to me suggests a couple of things. It suggests that this wasn't something that was going to happen right away. It wasn't something that was going to be automatic that they would be brought to complete unity. It would be a process to get there. And that suggests that before you get to complete unity, there's going to be something less than complete unity. And you have to go through the less than complete unity to get to the complete unity. And Jesus knew that that was going to be the case. And so he's praying I think praying that we'll stick with it when there's less than complete unity until we reach the point that there is complete unity. Unity matters because it matters to Jesus. Because it matters to Jesus, he prayed for it. Because he prayed for it, it matters. And if Jesus prayed for it and it mattered to him, then I believe his prayer will be answered. I cannot for one moment believe that something for which Jesus prayed so earnestly at just before he went to the cross in this amazing prayer, I cannot believe that that prayer will not be answered. I believe it will. And if Jesus prayed for it, then I believe that we should be praying for it too. In fact, I think there may well be times in the coming days when we feel that that's all that we can do. And it might be all that we can do, but I think it is what we must do and must keep on doing. That we must never stop praying for God's church to be brought to complete unity. Because Jesus prayed for it, and if he prayed for it, I believe it will happen. And when we are in that stage of less than complete unity, we don't give up, but we keep praying. When we think of those three situations that I mentioned earlier, how do we express our unity as one church? When the primary sense of belonging is three congregations, we keep praying, keep us one and bring us to complete unity. As we explore issues of human sexuality, what does it look like for unity to happen amongst people who hold views which appear irreconcilable when the disagreements become obvious and evident and public? What do we do? We keep on praying. God, bring your church to complete unity. And we try to work out what relationships look like with members of other worshipping communities. Some of whom, as we said, were until recently part of this church, but have now chosen to worship elsewhere. We keep praying, God, bring your church to complete unity. And what will that unity look like between our three congregations on the issues that we disagree about with other worshipping communities? Don't know. How will we get there? Don't know. I wish I could say that I have a complete set of answers for all those questions that I could lay out before you and say, this is the roadmap. But I don't. There are times when I feel optimistic and have faith that we can work out unity in all of those areas. There are times when I feel less optimistic and wonder if we'll ever see true unity in those areas, whether we will hold it together. And it's in those moments when I'm feeling less optimistic that I find myself coming back to the prayer of Jesus. 
and choosing to join in that prayer with him. And that's what I would invite and encourage us all to do. In those times when we can't see the way through to what complete unity looks like, we come back to the prayer of Jesus and we say, Lord, you prayed for all your people to be brought to complete unity. And I believe that your prayer will be answered. Right here and now, I can't see how it will happen. But because you prayed for it, so will I. Why does unity matter? Because unity matters to Jesus. He spoke about it. He taught about it. He prayed for it. And if I'd had the time, I could have added a third one. We know that it matters to Jesus because Jesus died to bring it about. When Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, talking about the work of Jesus and thinking particularly about the Jewish Gentile separation that I mentioned earlier, Paul says this, he says, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. One new humanity in Christ through the cross. Why does unity matter? Because it matters to Jesus. He spoke about it, he taught about it, he prayed for it, and he died to bring it about. How dare we not say it's important? If it was so important to Jesus, how dare we make it any less important to us? However difficult it is to say, it matters to Jesus. So it matters to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you've heard all the words that have been spoken. You know the thoughts that have gone through every mind as I've been speaking. You know the emotions that have been stirred in our hearts as we've been speaking. And we lay all of that before you. And we thank you that we have the assurance of your word that one day your church, which is your bride, will be presented to you as a pure, spotless bride. I believe that one day your church will be presented to you having been brought to complete unity with no separation, no division. Because we believe that that will happen one day, we commit ourselves to saying, until that day comes, we will not stop praying. We will not stop speaking about unity, we'll not stop talking about it, we'll not stop praying for it, we'll not stop working towards it. Because we believe it matters to you. So Lord Jesus, today we join with you in your prayer. And we say, for your church throughout the world, for your church in this nation, for your church here in Warfield, may we be brought to complete unity so that the world will know that the Father sent you. We join in your prayer. May we be brought to complete unity, we pray. In your name, Lord Jesus, and for your glory. Amen.